today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some efforts that uh, my team's been doing with regards to trying to look at the Eurobiome and really go in depth into our um, investigation. And so I'm often referring to we, I do very little um, other than perhaps feed and wrangle some of the uh, students in my group. Um, but a lot of our work is done in collaboration with Beth Mueller and Alan Wolf, who may or may not know, um, who are both also at Loyola, but they're at our medical campus. So given the group that's here today, um, I am certain that you have, if not done, read many a um, short read variable region sequencing study. Um, so these are the sequences or the sequencing studies that really defined what types of bacteria and in fact, um, predating that, that bacteria was found in the urinary tract of healthy individuals. And these short read um, variable region sequencing surveys have been conducted on the urine samples from healthy males and females, as well as individuals with lower urinary tract symptoms and cancers. With the short read variable region sequencing, um, this is often Illumina sequencing, they are targeting variable regions of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequence, hence my stock photo of um, the variable regions uh, found there in that sequence. And there, of course, has been great work already in the literature for the Eurobiome community talking about which variable region um, provides greater insight and granularity to the particular taxa of the Eurobiome. It's important to note that variable regions, when they're targeted, often cannot resolve species level um, for some genera. And so to kind of prove that point, um, I'll show you um, a phylogenetic tree here. So this was work that was led by one of my former master's students, Genevieve Badu, shown there, um, in which case we had near um, 1,200 isolates from uh, pr primarily catheterized urine samples from females. And um, we did 16S, full 16S sequencing of these isolates. And what we did was um, identify the individual taxa of those and showing this phylogenetic tree here, it's representative of 161 different species um, belonging to 72 different genera. And not anything unique really about how we did this analysis, but we actually utilized some of the software that was developed um, in uh, Lisa Carson's lab. And we simulated the different variable regions and then compared the results that we were getting from those variable regions to the known species identification. And so in the outer rings of this particular um, uh, graphic here, we can see um, circles indicating that the genus prediction was incorrect or the species um, prediction was incorrect. And I should note that you know the variable regions really aren't um, ever, haven't ever claimed that they can give um, species level resolution. So <laughs> these short read sequencing um, projects have been really you know, instrumental again in, in trying to give us a, a bird's eye view into the Eurobiome, but I'm interested in delving into alternative solutions. And so um, I'm going to present today two different studies which I thought would be in submission, but alas, they are still in the process of getting submitted. Um, and uh, both of these studies actually are focusing on the Eurobiome of individuals with UTIs. And so again, I'm assuming that this audience is familiar that E. coli is, the, is often referred to as the most um, common cause of acute UTIs. Um, some studies claim upwards of 70%. Um, other studies can claim down to uh, lower percentages. But the first question that I wanted to ask is, are E. coli UTIs caused by a single strain of E. coli? So is it a single strain that is entering the urinary tract and then colonizing it? And so in our study, we had 33 urine samples from females with a clinical diagnosis of UTI, 
And we had 14 urine samples from females that had no lower urinary tract symptoms. And all of these were catheterized urine samples. And we conducted full length 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing using the PacBio platform. And so the PacBio platform provides longer reads with um, a relatively nominal error rate. Um, I know that this has been something that they've been striving towards getting at that Illumina level error rate for the past uh, decade or so. And so this was the work of a former uh, student of mine, Delaney Sawyer shown here. And we did our analysis using kind of the standard pipeline uh, of data too. And so the first graph I wanna show you here are our UTI positive samples. And so um, we have relative abundance here along the, um, the X axis and each one of these are individual participants from which we collected that urine sample. The most frequently observed urotype, meaning that over 50% of the taxa identified in that um, urine sample was those belonging to um, Escherichia shigella. And here I'm just showing the genus name. Uh, we also see one individual who had a UTI of Enterococcus, um, a few here that had Klebsiella uh, associated um, UTIs, and um, then these two individuals have Aerococcus as their dominant urotype. And we have one sole one with a pseudomonas. The remainder are what we refer to as a mixed urotype. And I will note that um, there was no designation of the cause of UTI uh, provided to us when we selected these samples. And so we can see that the majority of them are likely the result of E. coli. However, we see some other um, potential uropathogens contributing to the symptoms observed. In our UTI negative samples, we started with many more, but many of them actually did not produce sufficient um, reads, likely due to a low biomass and low DNA concentration, um, such that we could really um, present a relative abundance that was meaningful. Nevertheless, we have several instances of um, this kind of mixed urotype um, and then we have three individuals whose urotype is dominated by lactobacilli, and we actually do have one individual whose um, urotype is uh, essentially um, all E. coli associated strains or sequences. So returning back to the original question here, um, was most curious with regards to, is there a single strain of E. coli that's um, introduced and then um, colonizes within there, or um, is this potentially a multi-E. coli um, infection? And so um, thus far, I've been showing these graphs and just representing things at the genus level, which is, of course, what those variable regions alone will give us. But with the full length, we can actually go down to that species level. And so um, here I've got a graph that's actually showing the different species of E. coli. So if you follow the E. coli phylogenetic discussion now, thanks to GTDB, um, there's uh, really one genus that is being called Escherichia shigella and many different um, species that are falling within that. And so in this graph, what I've got is the different species of Escherichia shigella listed here on the left. And um, across, I have the individual patients or participants that were E. coli dominant. And I have indicated the presence of that particular species with a green dot. And the um, diameter of that dot is um, reflective of the number of unique ASVs. So the number of unique sequences that are representative of that particular species. At the top, I've listed the, the total number of different ASVs as well as that relative abundance that was shown in the previous ones. Um, and for the sake of just comparison, I also included two of the participants that were not E. coli dominant or didn't have that E. coli um, uh, urotype just to see how many different ASVs and how many different species were found um, in those participants' uh, urine samples. And as we can see from this graph, if we look at it um, sample or participant wise, 
Um, there's often multiple different green dots, but intriguingly, there's also instances in which there's multiple different ASVs that are representative of the same species. And so, of course, I mentioned previously that there is that nominal um, error rate. And when we um, corrected for that, we still saw instances in which there were multiple different 16F sequences that were present at different relative abundances within that sample, suggesting that it's not a single um, individual strain that is colonizing that particular individual. Um, one exception here would be the sample 7771, which only has three different ASVs. And if you're familiar, E. coli has on average seven um, copies of the 16S ribosomal RNA, and there is some variation within a particular strain. So they're not all seven identical copies. What this sample or what this study has really done is just show us that full length 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing is um, a method that we can apply to studying the urobiome, and it can give us some insight into species, not to say that um, it doesn't require further investigation or um, you know, additional culture uh, studies to help identify uh, new species within the urobiome or emerging species. But based upon our preliminary analysis, it looks that UTIs are frequently the result of colonization by multiple strains, and this is something that we are uh, continuing to investigate. In a second study I wanted to discuss, again, we're going to leave the safety of short read um, uh, sequencing. And we set out to ask the question, you know, are UTI causing E. coli from the gut? So the prevailing hypothesis is that the bladder is colonized by E. coli that um, comes from the, the gut or the rectum. And so this was in collaboration with several of our um, clinical team at Loyola. And um, they went out and recruited English speaking female patients that were greater than um, 18 years old. And they had presented to the Loyola Women's um, Clinic with symptoms of UTI. Only once they were confirmed via urine dipstick as having a UTI, um, were they uh, engaged further. And so um, they provided multiple different questionnaires for us to give us a lot of metadata about this population. So, oops, wrong button. Um, just some patient demographics. So uh, the mean age of our um, population here was postmenopausal um, and the, pro the, the most of our participants were um, white. And so there are other elements that are shown here. So once these 38 individuals provided samples, and I'll, I'll disclose that in a second, um, their urine samples were actually sent to our clinical micro lab. And there they were tested specifically for E. coli. So if they were found to have E. coli in abundance of 10 to the five CFU per mil, then it was determined as having an E. coli UTI. So in order to really get at our initial question and that um, initial hypothesis, we took samples from the bladder via catheterization. We also collected samples um, from swabs of the rectum. And we have also collected samples, although not uh, yet analyzed, um, swabs from the vagina. Now, Thus far, we really only focused our analysis on urine samples and rectal swab samples. And we took those urine samples and rectal swab samples, and we actually introduced them to different media and different conditions to enrich the bacteria. Um, we recognized that these samples were going to likely provide or include human cells, and we wanted to deplete the human cells while also providing um, the nutrients to, to really boost and um, enrich the bacteria that we were most interested in looking at. And this was a very short culture period followed by DNA extraction and sequencing. And our sequencing was done using a metagenomic approach. 
So no prior amplification or targeting of the 16S. We used a software tool called Strong to identify strains that were in the same phylo group or the same haplotype or the same putative strain um, in the two samples. And we had several observations after running this software. The first is we found instances in which um, Strong identified multiple different species, sorry, multiple different strains of E. coli within the rectal swab sample. We also found instances in which a single strain was found in both the urine sample as well as the um, fecal, or I'm sorry, the rectal swab sample. And lastly, we had instances in which um, a single strain was found to be shared between the urine sample and the rectal swab sample, but um, sometimes the rectal swab sample also had additional strains of E. coli found there. And so this graphic um, represents the results of our analysis over the 19 patients that um, we found cases in which at least one strain was shared between the rectal swab sample and the urine sample. And so to orient you to this graph, it is a phylogenetic tree based upon the core genome of these metagenome assembled genomes, um, otherwise known as MEGs. And so the same patient um, is indicated uh, by the same color. And so just to pick on this mauve color here, so this is participant number 21, and we have um, her bladder sample as well as her rectal swab sample. And so these two E. coli strains were found to be most similar to each other um, relative to the other ones that were examined. And so we can see instances in which we have multiple um, E. coli genomes representative of the same participant. And so these are just cases in which different enrichment medias um, were found to have the same strain. So we, for instance, here have um, LB enrichment as well as NYC enrichment from the rectal swab as well as NYC and limb enrichment for the bladders. Um, this graph also can highlight the fact that not all, in essence, paired samples from the same participant are found next to each other in the phylogenetic tree. And so for instance, we have this brown instance, that's participant 27, in which case the rectal swab had a um, E. coli phylotype B2, and that's quite different from the um, other B2 phylotype instance um, found here in the bladder from the same patient. So um, for instance, this particular one here in brown is actually more similar to the E. coli isolated from different patients than it is to the one that came from the rectal swab. As another way of kind of visualizing this, um, here's an example of a multiple sequence alignment of the E. coli genomes for participant number two. And we have bladder representatives here and rectal representatives here. And um, this, graphic is just showing with regards to opacity, um, the more translucent a block of the genome is, um, the more similar or identical those sequences are. Um, and this is an example of participant two where we found their mags in the same place in the tree. That's in contrast to, for instance, participant 17. And we can see that these are much darker bars and actually these dark lines are indicative of um, regions of dissimilarity between their genomes when we align them. And so um, we would posit that this is not a likely recent introduction from the rectum to the bladder, given the amount of sequence divergence that's observed between these two mags. And I should note that thus far I've really focused on E. coli, but um, we have also been able to identify um, species of different bacterial um, members of the urobiome that are found in both rectal and um, rectal swab and bladder samples. And here's just listing a few of those. With those particular participants that had E. coli in both their rectal swab and their urine sample indicated with the blue stars. So just as a recap here, um, shotgun metagenomic sequencing 
has enabled us to look at the microbiota at the strain level. Um, this is actually a project that we worked on for over two years because we did a lot of fumbling around to figure out how best to really try to pull out strain level um, variants within a given neurobiome sample. Um, and so based upon our results, we can confidently say that not all E. coli predominated UTIs are recent invasions from the rectum. We have instances in which um, the strains found in the rectum do not very closely resemble those found in the bladder. And this observation really fits into um, some previous hypotheses that dysbiosis of pre-existing microbiota in the bladder can also cause um, acute UTIs and symptoms. And so with that, I'll just end saying thank you to you all for being here and listening. And also thanks to the people who gave me money.